let's see. I guess unless there's any other questions, we'll go ahead and get started. Again, today our main topic is applying the ASC7 load combinations, seeing how they are applied, uh, seeing what types of um, systems and loads they can be applied to, et cetera. Now, as a brief review from, say, mechanics, uh, let's consider the types of loads uh, in general that you can have in this honey structure. And here I'm not talking about the specific code ones like wind and rain and snow. I'm talking much, much, much more general. Uh, we can have a few. And these are fairly self-explanatory. We can have point loads. One-dimensional loads, actually zero-dimensional loads. Um, yeah, I, I would call it a zero-dimensional load. Uh, you can have point loads, which are loads applied to a single point on a structure. You can have line loads, which are a constant or varying uh, linear pattern of load. Um, line loads, or you can have, uh, you can also have area loads. which are applied over an area, as the name might imply. So I'm just going to, oh, wait, this is not fun to draw. Yeah. I'm no good at drawing area loads. Maybe something like this. something kind of like this, a pressure spread over an area of usually a floor slab or over a wall. And you can also have body loads. And this would just represent, oh, we could represent this as maybe a cube. We don't deal with body loads that often in civil engineering, so you're not gonna encounter them uh, fairly often, but I don't know, maybe I can, maybe I can draw a little center of mass thing here, and then an arrow downward from that. So these are our general types of loads. We have point loads, again, which are applied at a single point on a beam or a floor slab or a wall, et cetera. You have line loads, which are, which are distributed along a beam or along a column in the lateral direction. You have area loads, which are applied over a surface, over either a a horizontal or vertical surface, and those represent either dead load, live load, wind load, et cetera. In fact, actually, no, that, that'll work fine. Uh, dead, live, wind, et cetera. And then you have body loads, which uh, examples of body loads would be things like, oh, I don't know, the, the self weight of a fluid, and uh, especially if you have like inertial loads from fluids, uh, maybe you've had a really big tune mass damper or something, you get that kind of thing. But we generally don't deal too much with. Uh, we generally don't deal too much with uh, body loads in most structural engineering contexts. All right. So that's, I just wanted to review very briefly from statics and mechanics, but how does this again relate to the application of the load combinations? Well, load combinations um, wind, rain, seismic, dead load, live load, your dead load, live load, wind, seismic, rain, snow, uh, can produce really any of these types of loads. Now, primarily most of these are going to act as a uh, line or area loads and primarily area loads and things like dead load and live load. But really all of these can, um, a dead load can be represented. You can have dead load that arises from a point load, say like a, a single heavy column load on a beam. You can have live load that's a column, like you can have a live load that is a point load. For example, a particularly heavy piece of machinery that might be a, uh, worthy of consideration in design. So for example, in a uh, 
In a setting like a hospital, when designing a hospital, for example, you will have, um, when designing a hospital, uh, there are many things, of course, you need to consider in design, but one of them actually is one of the more uh, uh, interesting and sort of bizarre things is you actually have to consider the design of, uh, of MRI machines. See, MRI machines are actually these big honking pieces of equipment that also generate very large magnetic fields around them. And so whenever the, whenever the MRI machine turns on, it generates these large magnetic forces in the entire building frame around it. So you actually need to put a lot of detailing in and, and special design around any room containing an MRI machine. So um, that is one, uh, that's an example of a localized piece of equipment that would produce live load on a structure. And, and that would be represented by something like a point load. So again, all of these types of loadings that can produce any of our basic sort of theoretical elementary static types of loadings. And in our load combinations, we are applying multipliers, our load factors, we will apply a load factor to all instances of that type of load. And we will see what that means. So again, we will apply a multiplier on all instances of that type of load. And let's now consider what that means. So let's say we have a beam. And mm, how might I do this? Let's say there are, let's look at just dead load for instance. Uh, let's say we have, oh, I don't know, a 20 kips per foot. Oh, that is way too high, maybe two kips per foot. So a two kip per foot uh, dead line load. And then let's say we have a 10 kip point load in the middle. And then, um, although it may not be needed here, let's just say this beam is 15 feet long. Um, from one support to the load and then to the point load and then another 15 feet on each side. So let's say here we have the system where we have two different loads. We have a constant value line load across the entire beam and then we have a point load coming down at the beam center. So let's explore and again all of these are, let me go ahead and label these as uh, all dead load. So all of these are dead load. And let's look at how this reacts when we apply a load combination of say 1.4D, the first ASC7 load combination. Well, so for this, again, we apply a load factor to all instances of that load type on a structure. Doesn't matter how complex it is, when we apply a load combination, we're going to apply that same factor to all instances and all varieties of that load on a structure. So we redraw this beam, the factored load. Oh, and uh, in terms of terminology or viewing from previous lectures, uh, as I haven't applied any multipliers on these yet, um, maybe I can label these in, oh, blue would be nice. Maybe service, these are, these are, as they are unmultiplied, unincreased, these are service loads. So now I'm going to apply the ASC 716 uh, first load combination, which is 1.4 times dead load. And that is going to apply to all of them, to all instances of the load. So I know how to do some basic multiplication, thankfully. Uh, I know that 1.4 times 10, that is going to be a 14 kip magnified load. And then we'll still have that line load. And 
And now though, it will be magnified as well. And 1.4 times two, that will be 2.8 kips per foot. So we have magnified our dead loads by applying the first uh, 1.4 times D, our first ASC7 LRFD load combination. And the dimensions would of course remain unchanged. And then we could run through all of our statics, all of our uh, mechanics, calculate whatever we're looking for, whether it's deflections, rotations, stresses, strains, etc. Oh, and uh, keep in mind, these would be not service loads anymore, these would be design loads. So we have multiplied them, so now these are design loads. Uh, yes. Ah, okay. These are the uh, these are the ASC seven sixteen load combinations. Um, the question is, why did I multiply by one point four? These are I'm working. I'm looking at examples of the ASC seven load combinations, um, and uh, you can find a link to the PDF. There is a PDF of them on uh, the Moodle page. You can check those out. Um, maybe have those in front of you. And uh, again, all of these are dead loads. I am just telling us that all of these are dead loads. And so when we multiply uh, by one, for our first load case, we're going to magnify the dead loads. And so I'm just, in, in, in this case, since everything on this beam is dead load, we just go ahead and multiply everything by 1.4. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you. Um, and then we're gonna look at a slightly more complex one. And hopefully this will illustrate the idea, the concept a little more um, now. And that's when, now that's all well and good, but how do we handle it when there are, uh, when there's more than one uh, type of load, as there are in almost any type of real structure? Uh, those are the various types of loading you'll have on a structure. Like the, que the question is, what are the D, L, W, R, S? Those represent the dead load, the live load, the snow load, the wind load, etc. Yep, thanks. So let's look at something a little bit more complex now. All right, and I think I will actually draw out a simple frame structure to illustrate this point. So let's say we have a simple frame structure like this. And then uh, let's say there are a variety of uh, loads applied to this. Let's say we have a, a 10 kip load like this. Oh, that, uh, yeah, it's a little boring, but that'll be fine. <laughs> and uh, let's say that is a P dead, a dead load, P sub D for dead load, and it's 10 kips. And then let's apply a different load, maybe in green, for a live load. Maybe for some reason we have a horizontal live load. It's hard to think of what would generate a weird load combination like a uh, weird uh, loading like this, but that's fine. We're just talking theory right now. And let's say we have a 15 kip, uh, that is a PL, a live load. So we have live and we have dead. Oh, that's not the right color. I wanna match the colors here if I can. Let's see, too many markers. There we go. This is more orangish. And so again, this here is a dead load. So let us look at the first two load combinations uh, in ASC7. And um, well, 
Actually, I'll go ahead and write out the full load combination. I'll go ahead and write out the full uh, second load combination for um, just uh, for illustration. And the full load combination. And this does get pretty heady, so look out. Um, so let's see. The first, uh, uh, the second load combination again is one point, or the first one I should write out is one point four D. Again, that's our first load combination representing a essentially a very large dead load. And then our second load combination is 1.2D plus 1.6L um, plus 0 0.5 times LR, roof live load, or snow load, or rain load. An OR statement. And uh, again, what this meant, what this represents, the OR represents is that when this this particular load combination, the second load combination, is essentially three in one. In other words, you will apply uh, if you have all of these loads on your structure, you're going to uh, first apply this load combination, looking at the dead plus the live with the roof live load. Then you're going to look at it with the dead plus the live uh, uh, with the snow load. Then you're going to look at dead plus live with the rain load. But for our combination, for our example here, that's not going to matter too much because on our simple structure here, we don't have roof live load or snow load or rain load, so we can just ignore those for this example. So let's go ahead and calculate the loads or, or draw out the loads on the structure for each load case. So I'm going to say load combination one and load combination two. Now, for load combination one, we are applying only 1.5, or sorry, 1.4 times the dead load. And we're not applying any live load with that. So if I'm applying load combination one to the structure, like so, the loading will look something like this. I will have a load of 14 kips applied at the center, and I will have no live load whatsoever. This live load here is not going to appear anywhere in my load diagram of load combination one. Again, it's not 1.4D times plus 1.6 or plus 1.0 times L. It is simply 1.4 times D. So again, the purpose of the load combinations is that you have a variety of loads that are applied to a structure, and it is unlikely that the most extreme events in uh, in each of these load combinations or each of these load cases will apply all at once. You're not going to get that. Uh, we've discussed previously the the idea of a super heavy live load, for example. Like there is a event that causes the building to be just packed full of people. That super packed event is not likely to occur at the same time as the biggest hurricane of the century rolls in um, and uh, and uh, causes your critical wind event or, criti or uh, the critical rain event or whatever it might be. Your critical loading events are not, they don't, they will not, it is very unlikely for them to correspond to each other. And our load combinations allow us to um, sort of model the various uh, scenarios that we might be looking at. So. Uh, for example, in this, in load combination two, this represents a heavy live load event. And even now in that critical live load event, you're not going to get the um, super magnified, massive, biggest case dead load, but you'll get more of a normal amount of dead load. And you're not going to get the biggest snow or rain event, but you might get a small rainstorm, a moderate amount of rain load or roof live load or snow load. Anyway, look at the previous video, the lecture 4A, if you want to see more, uh, more of that dis discussed in depth. But anyway, back to our example. So when we're applying just the dead load there, uh, when we're t applying load combination one, we all put now, okay, you can see on the PDF there is, but this is load combination one. Uh, load combination one, again, is just 1.4 times dead load. And when applying that, the only load I'm going to apply to the structure is 1.4 times any dead load. And this dead load is 10 kips. So 10 kips times 1.4 is 14 kips. Uh, then load combination two, we're going to apply 1.2 times the dead load plus 1.6 times the live load. Let me 
move this a bit. Put that up. So on this structure, we're still going to have dead load, but it's going to be multiplied by 1.2 rather than 1.4. And so we'll have a dead load of 12 kips acting downward at the center. Again, how I got that is we're looking at load in this uh, particular part of the problem. We're looking at load combination two and the multiplier on the dead load is 1.2. So 1.2 times my dead load of 10 kips gives us 12 kips. Next, I want to apply the 1.6 times the live load. And our live load is right here, this 15 kip live load. And I'm going to apply a magnified load of 1.5, uh, or sorry, 1.6 times 15 kips. And I cannot do that one part in my head. Um, so the caffeine has kicked in at least. So let's do 1.6 times 15. And that comes to, oh, oh, that's not, uh, that comes to 24 kips. So 24 kips for our live load, our magnified live load. Twenty-four kips for our magnified live load. Okay. So, and then we would go and run through all of our structural analysis and the kind of structural analysis we're actually going to learn how to do more uh, later in the term. Uh, the general general uh, structure for this course is I start with some very basic, um, very foundational theoretical discussions of loading, and then we build up to uh, later discussions of um, detailed structural analysis techniques. Anyway, so again. Capping this out on the live load on the load combination discussion, uh, when applying um, your load combinations, uh, you go and you look at all the loads on the structure. And uh, for this one, I only considered the first two because while there are other load combinations uh, in existence, while there are other load combinations, say like in the ASC 716 uh, LRFD load combinations, which you, again you can see the full list on uh, the website um, on Moodle. But the uh, the only two that are going to be critical for this one are the first two because those represent the largest live load case and the largest dead load case. When you have a when you have a much larger structure, a more complex structure with or a real world structure where you have all of your loads, uh, snow, rain, wind, seismic, etc., you have to you're going to have to run through the whole set, which uh, can of course get quite complex. But again, the basic process is that for each load combination, we will apply multipliers only to that type of loading, and will only apply the types of loads that are uh, considered in that load combination. In our in the first load combination, we apply, again, our structure uh, is expected to experience uh, 10 kips of dead load and 15 kips of live load. Um, I don't know how you get a horizontal live load, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> um, so regardless of where the uh, how the loads are laid out or their origin, when you apply uh, the load combinations here for the first one, we'll be multiplying the, the dead load by 1.4, so we'll have a 14 kip dead load. And then in load combination two, we will have a 20% magnified dead load and a 60% magnified live load. And that's the basic process of the load combinations. Any questions so far? Okay. So let's see. Sorry, I had to let a cat out of here that was sleeping under the bed. Anyway. Oh, the foibles of Zoom. And I want to work through one other example, perhaps a little bit more uh, complex. And this example is going to look at uh, how to handle the types of load combinations where you do have those or statements. And how those statements where you do have those ors in them really mean that those load combinations are actually three load combinations in one, or sometimes even if you have two or statements, they're more like six load combinations in one.
right, so um, let's see what happens. I think on this one we'll just do a simple beam. We'll just do a simple beam on this one. And or actually, let's mix it up and make it a column. We're living on the wild side. We'll make this a column. That's how cool I am. Anyway, let's say we have a load P applied to a column. And let's say that this has components uh, D, L, L, R. Um, I guess I'll use a lowercase r to be consistent. Um, snow and rain. So, in other words, there. This I'm going to draw. I'm drawing this as a single downward point load, but in reality, that point load is represented by a variety of service level loads, or is composed of a variety of service level loads. So let's say it has a, a p dead of uh, ten kips, a p live of fifteen of oh yeah fifteen is fine, a roof live load of um oh I don't know let's say three kips snow load equals to oh let's say four kips and rain load equal to two kips. Okay, so um, thinking about what thinking about this here, um, thinking about which of these might control. So really, if we want to run through the full load combinations, our only our, if we wanted to do this properly, our only method really is to run through the full load combinations. Well, at least any that uh, feature the ones that we're considering here. So what these would ultimately represent is sort of a single member design. Like if you apply your dead load, your uh, service level dead load, or your service level roof live load perform a structural analysis, and then on this member, you have some service level dead load, service level uh, live load, etc. And so we're looking at, in this case, we'd be looking at the design, we would be looking at the design of a single column. And so you have, um, so let's say I performed a variety of structural analyses at the service level, the unmagnified loads, and I've determined based on those that uh, in the dead load case, this column will experience a load of 10 kips, in the live load case, it will experience an axial load of 15 kips. In the roof live load, it will experience an axial live load of 3 kips. Snow load, 4 kips. Rain load, 2 kips. So, what do we actually design this column for? Um, in terms of actually sizing it, in terms of selecting cross-sectional area, in terms of selecting geometries, etc. Well, I'm going to go ahead and erase this board here. And then we'll start working through this. And this is going to be a bit more complex because we have a lot more combinations we'll need to consider. So let's look at the first load combination, which is 1.4 times dead. So we have 1.4 times dead load, which is just going to be 1.4 times 10 kips. So that's going to be 14 kips. Fairly simple. Uh, our second load combination is going to be, let's see, we're going to have, that is 1.2 times, well, okay. This is where things get interesting. So remember, the second load combination, the full form is 1.2 times D plus 1.6 times L plus half, 0 0.5, of roof live load or snow load or rain load. Which this means that, and what that represents, it's, okay, the Oregon it does not mean you simply pick your favorite. It doesn't mean just, oh, I like, you know, roof live load and so I'm going to apply that one. No, it means that you essentially have to check each one of these 
Um, and in, the, in our case, it would be fine just to pick the largest one um, because all of the loads are acting in the same direction. So, um, and in fact, maybe I'll actually label these, um, maybe I'll kind of label these A, B, or no, I'll just use the LR case. That'll, that'll avoid, I don't want to create too many more labels. Um, so this is again, our load case three, but we're going to have to, we're essentially going to have to run this one three times for our, uh, oh no, sorry, load combination two, not three. Um, this is our full load combination two. We're essentially going to have to run this, uh, three times to take into account the various, uh, uh, permutations, the, uh, considering either the roof live load, the snow load or the rain load. So for, uh, maybe I'll call this one, um, instead of just two, maybe I'll call this one two LR. The case of load combination two, where we're looking at the roof live load. And so that would then be 1.2 times the dead load of 10 kips plus 1.6 times the live load of 15 kips of so the live load of 15 kips plus 0 0.5 of the roof live load, which is three kips. So let me throw that into my calculator and see what we get. So 1.2 times 10 plus 1.6 times 15, plus, I guess that's just 1.5. And if I did that math correctly, I get 37.5 kips. So 37.5 kips for the, um, the load combination two, where we're considering the roof live load. Then maybe I could call this next one two uh, S for the load combination two that involves snow load. And this would be the same 1.2 times 10 plus 1.6 times our live load of 15 uh, plus 0 0.5, but this times, this in this case, times our snow load of four kips. And that will then come to, if I just multiply by, uh, add, a, add a two instead of 1.5, that will then come to 38 kips. Um, and then 2R, which would be the case where, which is the subcase of load combination two, where we're dealing with the rain load. And so that would be 1.2 times 10 plus 1.6 times 15 plus 0 0.5 uh, times uh, two. And that would then come to uh, 37 kips. So we see that we see now that again, uh, we have looked at load combination one, but all three of these subcases, uh, two LR, two S, and two R, these all represent subcases of load combination two. Any time in the load combinations where you see an or, what that really means is that that one load combination listed in the uh, ASC seven that represents multiple load combinations listed as one for the sake of brevity. Okay. So looking at the rest of these, um, I don't think we're going to have to worry about uh, five through six and uh, or and also we're not going to have to worry about four through, uh, I should say, we're, we're not going to have to worry about four through seven because those are the critical uh, cases involving, um, those are the critical cases involving um, uh, the critical wind events and the crit critical seismic events. And we don't have any wind or seismic on this one. So if you don't have the load combination, um, I mean, you, you could run, if you want to, you can go ahead and verify the calculations, but those ones obviously are not going to control for this beam design, for this column design. However, we should consider load combination three. And this one, um, this one, if you look at it, it the full form of it is uh, 1.2 times D plus 1.6 times LR or S or R uh, plus um, L or 0 0.5 times W. So 
This is a real hairy one. This is probably the most complex one um, in the basic load combinations. This, if we wanted to do the full calculation of this, we would have six subtypes. We would have an LR paired with alive. We'd have a snow paired with alive. We'd have rain paired with alive. Basically, this represents six different load subload combinations in one. Um, thankfully, for our, but, but what you can do in, in cases like this, where you have a relatively simple case where everything's acting in um, everything is acting in tandem or at least in the same direction. So things, uh, so um, we're not we're not dealing with the results of a complex structural analysis. So, well, actually, we are, but we're looking at the final results. We're not applying a final uh, a complex structural analysis here. So what we can do is simply say, in this case, for this particular load combination, first of all, we have no wind load for. So for our case, I can just ignore the or wind load, thankfully, and and on our. Um, on this one, since all on our uh, first OR statement, the roof live load versus snow load versus um, uh, versus rain load, uh, since they're all acting in the same direction, I see no reason I can't just pick the largest one, which is snow load at uh, four kips. So for load combination three, um, maybe I'll put should circle that. So for load combination three, I can just do 1.2 times 10 plus 1.6 times the magnified uh, snow load. Well, to get the magnified snow load. Again, if I wanted to do this right and proper, and if you're implementing this in any kind of uh, uh, MathCAD, SMath, Excel, anything like that, uh, Python, or any kind of, if you're, if you're automating the calculation in, in any way, this wouldn't be that difficult because you can just, you know, have the computer run thing through things very quickly. But uh, for a simple problem like this, where everything's acting in the same direction, I can just pick the largest one because I know that's going to control among these ors here. Um, and so uh, for our 1.6 uh, times uh, LR, S, or R, the snow load is going to control. So I can just put a four kip load down and then plus R live plus 0 0.4, or live or 0 0.5 W, we don't have any wind load on this particular column, so we don't need to worry about the or W. So I can just put the live load, uh, an unmagnified live load of 15 kips. And uh, let's see, so that's going to be, uh, let's go ahead and calculate that. So 12 plus 15 plus 15, wait, uh, 12 plus, 1.6 times 4 plus 15, 1.6 times 4, yep, I get 33.4 kips. Well, let me just double check that, uh, 1.2 times 10 plus 1.6 times 4 times uh, plus 15. Yeah, and we get, I get 33.4 kips. And Again, the reason I'm not running through all, even though load combination three is we should, if we wanted to do it really proper, we should run through all of this kind of uh, sub load combinations like we did it uh, for load combination two. For the sake of brevity, I'm eliminating that and just saying, we know all these loads are acting in the same direction. Uh, so for that or case, I can, I can just pick the largest one. You can't always do that. You can only do that when you're looking at loads that on a simple kind of system where you know everything is acting in the same direction. You can have a good understanding of which are going to control, larger ones are going to control that sort of thing. But uh, so for our load combination three, the controlling value is 33.4. For our load combination two, the controlling value is 38. And for our uh, load combination one, the critical value is uh, 14. So, and if in a re in a, and in a real structure, we'd also have wind and seismic loading. And we would run through all of our various permutations, all of our combinations, all of our OR statements. You would get all of your various, um, all of your various values for each of these, and then you'd end up with a, then you'd simply compare them and find the largest one. And so what's going to control for our design here um, is going to be this 38 kip load. So the actual load that we're going to design the column for is going to be 38 kips. 
and we could check the later load combinations again, four through seven, but because we don't have wind and seismic, those will not control in this case. Um, so this is no longer our service load. This is our final design load. All right, questions on that? I know this is quite a lot. Um, I would encourage you to start looking at your textbook, look at some um, ex further examples of load combinations. Make sure you really get this because this really is important from the uh, point of view of basic structural analysis and structural design principles and philosophy. Okay, so I think that covers what I want to on basic load combinations in terms of uh, qualitative discussion and quantitative examples.